first started DJing um, at, at my mother's house in my bedroom at her crib. I went to go see Juice. I've told the story a, a lot of times. Um, I went to go see the movie Juice. Before that, I was kind of into skateboarding. Shout out to my man Stevie Williams. We used to actually skateboard together. And I was, wasn't that good, um, especially around a guy like Stevie who was really good. So skate, I mean, uh, DJing kind of, you know, after I saw saw the movie, it was it felt like something that, you know, I wanted to try out, take a hobby on at a young age. So I convinced my mom to buy me um, one turntable and a mixer. And um, um, uh, I had a mixer and one turntable. And that was my setup for probably a good year before I got another turntable. Started, you know, messing around, teaching myself, um, saving my lunch money and, and going down to uh, Armand's at 11 from Philbert in Philly and uh, and buying records every day. I, I mean, this will be my 20th year as a DJ. You know, I've been doing this since the beginning of high school. Um, my first party was, was ninth grade. I got paid $40. Um, I had one milk crate of records. Actually, did I have the milk crate? Yeah, I had a milk crate. I had one milk crate of records I did. It was a birthday party. So yeah, that was the beginning of my professional career. And my only objective at that time for DJing was just trying to get my name on a flyer. Like, um, where I used to go to school, Central High School, uh, up the block, Broad and Erie. You know, that's where all the high school flyers used to be and, you know, different, you know, colors and, you know, very simple shit. Not even compared to what's out now, but, you know, all the hot DJs at the time would always be on a flyer. And, I wanted to get my name on a flyer, so you know that's what my goal was, and I told myself anything after that was extra. What I was going to do after high school was either go to Temple, uh, I wanted to go to NYU, which I don't think I got into, but I was really in the film, so and I love New York as a city. And then there was Atlanta, and I actually maybe about two years before I went to school, took a trip down to Atlanta with my father. We, we, we drove down to Atlanta, bumping Southern Playlistic, Cadillac music the whole ride. You know, I, I had already become an outcast fan and I just really got a feel for the city of Atlanta and it was like, you know, it definitely early on gave me that feel like it, you know, this is some, some place that I could go to school but also kind of do my thing when it came to the music. So yeah, I met DJ Sense my first year. Cannon came to Clark the next year after that. Tall ass kid, looked like a basketball player, you know, on campus, you know, with a lot of energy telling me he made beats. At first I was like, yeah, okay, cool, you know. And then they actually gave me a BCD, and I was like, oh, this guy's serious. Um, so, you know, we, we, we linked up, and three of us just started really DJing, you know, anything on campus or the AUC, or, you know, we did it all. Like, every house party in the cafeteria, you know, all the Spelman parties, you know, more everything. We just, you know, when it came to, that, that was my stomping ground, you know, before I ruled the mixtape world, I ruled the AUC campus. You know, going to, to, the, to uh, school in Atlanta, it really helped transform me into the DJ I am today because, you know, you had so many people from so many places that you had to please. And then even me being from a up north east coast background where I had just come from playing, you know, Winter Wars and Black Moon and, you know, a tribe at parties to, you know, having to incorporate a whole new sound. Um, really taught me a lot of things about being a DJ, but with all due respect to Crunk, and clearly, you know, the voice of Gangster Girls is Little John, but I always felt like, you know, lyrically and um, on the artistry side, when Crunk was so big, that the South and Atlanta was getting overlooked for some of that talent. You know, people like, Cl I mean, of course, Outkast was, you know, phenomenal successes, but, you know, Big Boy in His Own or Killer Mike or, you know, watching Tip come up or, um, and, and, and people of the sort. So, you know, when I created that brand, that was part of how I envisioned it, you know, being bigger than just what people think is South music. And the concept of, of really having a, to continue a, a, a South series came because, you know, when I was going to the store trying to sell my shit, I couldn't compete with Slay and, and uh, Clue and, you know, um, Who Kid, I mean, with exclusives on the East Coast tape. and. You know, um, so the South was, I was there, you know, so I kind of took a formula that was popular up North at the time when, you know, um, I was I was go going into, you know, really taking mixtapes and, and trying to do my thing with them. 
and taking the, the concept of hosting and you know exclusives and using South music you know what I mean uh, um, I mean as simple as it sounds back then you know people would tell me it would never work you know what I mean like yo don't if you do a South tape don't talk on it they don't want to hear that don't play no new shit they want to hear what they know you know don't do freestyles and you know everything that Gangsta Girls has become is what they said people don't want to hear and and even with Big Oomp and them like at that time they weren't even really putting covers on their mixtapes like that you know um, it was just about the music so forth and you know I, I always wanted to my product to um, to stand out or you know to have quality when I was you know giving it out because I gave out as many CDs as I probably sold so um, yeah those were the early beginnings of of what the mixtape game was like.